Hi everyone, thanks for coming and, and welcome to the next installment of the UCL Dark Invited Speaker Series. Uh, today we're going to hear from Amy Zhang uh, on the topic of exploring context for better generalization in reinforcement learning. Uh, Amy well, has just graduated, I hear, from a, a PhD at McGill University and is now uh, doing a, a postdoctoral uh, fellowship, I guess, at, at Berkeley. Um, during her PhD, she was co-supervised by Joel Pino and Dorina Precup. Uh, and was a member of Facebook AI research. Um, she works on state abstractions, model-based reinforcement learning, representation learning, and of course, generalization in reinforcement learning. Amy, really to, excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, like you said, today I'll be talking more about exploring context for better generalization and, and reinforcement learning. And, and this work builds on top of you know, the work I'd done previously on by simulation and state abstractions, but those topics I'm going to skip over a bit, but please feel free to stop me and ask clarifying questions, um, or if you want to talk a little bit more about, about uh, state abstractions for the single test setting, um, we can also talk more about that. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll just get started. So I'm really excited about the potential of reinforcement learning uh, to be applied to the real world. And so um, a lot of my work on generalization, on trying to get better sample efficiency is very much geared towards thinking about these applications. And so specifically, the, the kinds of applications that I like thinking about that are natural for me are, are to think about personalized household robots, um, having robots that can that can perform a variety of tasks within a single home and generalize to new homes, uh, learned autonomous driving, having uh, autonomous cars that can generalize to new terrain that they weren't trained on and personalized healthcare, healthcare where we can train on a, on a data set of patients and, and obviously be able to extrapolate to new patients. So there's been a lot of exciting recent success in deep reinforcement learning in particular in the last few years. Um, and some examples of this that have been in, in sort of like the wider media are OpenAI, StarCraft, and Dota, DeepMind, AlphaGo, AlphaZero, and Atari. And so these are all examples where uh, deep RL algorithms have been able to achieve beyond human performance. But I think we're all aware that there's still a lot of disappointing failures and we're still not really seeing reinforcement learning in the wild yet. So why is there this discrepancy? Uh, we're seeing that DeepRL works really well in these single task settings in simulation when you have access to millions of transitions, but it works less well in visually complex, natural, and multitask settings. Uh, and specifically what I mean by this is that we're not seeing the same kind of generalization performance that we've been getting out of deep learning in computer vision and natural language processing. And so what I'm really interested in is, is structure and, and um, what kind of additional inductive biases can we leverage from the environments that we care about. So before I jump into that, I, you know, I think it's good to just sort of go over what is the typical setting that we assume in reinforcement learning. So we assume that the environment um, can be defined as a Markov decision process, which just means that we have a state space, S, an action space, A, a transition probability distribution, P, reward function R. And the agent sees states from the environment, ST, takes an action based on that based on that state, um, that, that action taken in the environment, steps it and updates it. And so uh, then the agent receives the next reward and next state. And the goal of the agent is to maximize this reward signal. And so an interesting question I think to, we can ask here is what kind of additional structure is reasonable to assume in MDPs in, in the environments that we care about. And so the focus of this talk is about context as structure. And so there are a couple of different additional assumptions that define these um, new types of MDP families that I'm going to focus on. So the first two are just these uh, block MDP and hidden parameter MDP. And so we're going to take both of these assumptions, which I'll describe in more detail later in this talk, um, for this paper on learning robust state abstractions for hidden parameter block MDPs. And later I'm going to talk about two papers that leverage contextual MDPs and also the block assumption on that block contextual uh, MDPs. So let's dive right in into this first paper, which is presented at iClear this year. Um, so the hidden parameter block MDP uh, family can be described by all the same components as what we have in the typical MDP, but we're adding on a couple of additional um, assumptions. So 
the first is that instead of seeing our latent, uh, our, our state space S, we're going to assume that this is latent. And instead, all we have access to is this observation space X. Um, and I think like a natural way to think about this setting is, is that we don't necessarily always have the most um, minimal sufficient statistic of the future dynamics and reward as the state space that we're given. Typically, we're given access to something that is much noisier or just like much higher dimensional because we don't necessarily know what information is necessary. Um, and so one example of this in robotics is, is just cameras. RGB cameras are a very cheap way to gather a lot of information about the world. Um, but what you can have in this setting is that there are many possible pixel images that can map to the same low dimensional state. And so you have this one to many mapping from states to observations, which can make the problem much more complex. Um, but, but knowing that we have this structure means that we can leverage it and get uh, better guarantees and, and possibly better algorithms. So that's the block uh, component. That's this observation space X and this one-to-many rendering mapping Q from S to X. Another assumption that we can make is, is this, this one about hidden parameter MDPs. So here we're assuming that we have multiple environments that have different dynamics. But all of the different dynamics can be described by a single universal dynamics model T. And uh, there's really just this latent variable or this hidden parameter space theta that can explain the variations in dynamics across these different environments that we have access to. And so T is conditioned on theta. And so this again maps to some real world applications. Um, so we can think of, of uh, the laws of physics, the universal dynamics of the world as T, uh, but depending on, on what task you're focusing on, um, like, uh, as an example, different objects have different dynamics and that, that can be explained by friction coefficients and like mass. And so those would be examples of this hidden, this, this latent parameter theta. So for this HIP BMDP setting, and, and we sort of conflate the term and also use it to name our method as HIP BMDP, um, we, our goal is to learn uh, so we're in, we're in this multitask setting, a constrained multitask setting where we assume that we have the same reward function. It's the same task. We're just trying to perform it in these different environments that have different dynamics. Uh, and because we're assuming this a multitask setting, we assume that we have access to environment IDs. And so in practice, this will just be a one hot vector that, that tells us which environment that we're in. And our goal is that we want to train this environment encoder psi to construct this latent task embedding, to construct this task embedding space. And the property that we want this space to have is that we want L2 distance in this task embedding space to correspond to some notion of the distance between these two environments. And we can define that distance between these environments to be the Wasserstein. Uh, and so the Wasserstein is just a distance between probability distributions. So this will be a distance between the probability distributions into next state of these different tasks. So another way to think about this is uh, the, the, dis the distance in terms of the L2 distance between task embeddings for different tasks corresponds to how different the dynamics between those two tasks are. And so in order to train this component, it requires that we have to train a dynamics model over all of these different environments. And so we train a universal dynamics model that is conditioned on the theta produced by this environment encoder. Um, and we use this to also measure distance between tasks in order to train this environment encoder. Uh, and so this, this, uh, so so that's how we train the environment encoder, and we train the state encoder in a very similar way um, using by simulation metrics. And so the state encoder uh, we train so that um, so that uh, it, it's just like a compressed version of the pixel observation space as well. Um, and so then this produces these two representation spaces, our task embedding space, our state embedding space. And now we can just train any policy optimization method on top of 
And so here we're just using soft target critic. But you can think of all of these components as being trained online together, but they are separate optimization steps. So with every step that the that the agent takes in the environment, we train our dynamics model and reward model. We train our state representation space, our environment um, representation space, and we train um, our actor and critic. So before we dive into empirical results, I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of theoretical analysis that we can do. So because in effect, we're learning this approximate by simulation abstraction, we can measure our, our error in terms of um, uh, how far. The, so by learning this abstraction, um, we're constructing a new MDP. And we are doing our policy optimization on top of this MDP as opposed to the original. And the reason that we want to do this is that because we're learning an abstraction of the original environment, we can construct it to be more amenable to learning. It can be a much smaller MDP um, because of this assumption of this like latent block structure. So the in order to measure sort of how far off this MDP is from the original and therefore how suboptimal is uh, is a Q function learned on this this new MDP going to be compared to the true optimal Q on top of the ground truth MDP, we want to use these error terms. So we have epsilon R, epsilon T, and epsilon theta, and these just correspond to the worst case error for any possible state action from our ground truth MDP and how where it maps to in, in terms of this abstract MDP. And we can just measure this as like a, empirically as the training error. So these two components really just describe a new MDP, which is close to the original for a specific task. Um, and this, this epsilon theta is now, you can think of this as a per task error because we're now in a multitask setting. So um, the first question that we want to ask is, uh, how does the error in theta prediction and the learned by simulation representation affect the learned optimal policy? And so the bound that we really want to compute here is, is, is this. And so I'm going to explain this notation. So this is saying um, that through our learned representations, we've constructed this approximate new MDP M bar. We're learning an optimal Q function on M bar, and so that can be denoted as Q uh, Q star M bar. And now we want to take the policy informed by this Q function and apply it back to the true environment. And so we're basically lifting it to this M theta. And we want to know what is the difference between Q star uh, learned on M bar and the true Q star of our ground truth environment. And so then we can see that this very simply um, that this, this difference is upper bounded by those terms that we had introduced in the last slide. And then this component is something that you can't really change. So um, R max is the maximum reward in your environment. And we know that the largest value that you can see in this environment is gonna scale with, uh, with respect to R max over one minus gamma, uh, our discount factor. So a very related result that we can also compute is how well is a policy trained in one task um, going to do when it's applied to another task. Uh, so moving from task uh, theta i to task theta j. So this is the exact same thing. Um, we've trained a Q star on our approximate version of theta i. We're going to apply it to theta j. And uh, that bound also depends on the same sorts of things, but it actually now has a term that lends itself really nicely to that task embedding space that we're learning. So here, now we're seeing that this notion of distance between tasks is incorporated in this bound as the L1 distance between theta i and theta j. So this is very similar now to that distance metric in our task embedding space. So um, I think one final nice thing to look at is the sample complexity analysis. Um, this analysis doesn't really apply to our algorithm because it's really only relevant for the tabular setting, but I think it's still useful to look at because it shows you exactly the kinds of gains that you get from making these additional assumptions of structure in your MVP. Um, so we get, uh, we get a speed up or, or improvement in sample complexity in two places. So the first is here. Um, so because of the block assumption, we know that our true state space 
is much smaller than the state space that we're given, or let's, we're calling it the observation space, so we can sort of denote these two separate spaces. So typically, if we don't use the block assumption, then this sample complexity analysis is going to depend on the cardinality of the space that you're that you're taking as input. So if it's high dimensional pixel space, then this is going to be huge. Um, because we know that we have the block assumption, we're learning the state abstraction that corresponds to like a much smaller equivalent MDP, we get this gain. Another gain that we get, um, because we're operating in this multitask setting, um, most sample complexity bounds for the multitask setting depend on the number of tasks that you see at training time. Because we're making this hidden parameter MDP assumption, which says that we're really in a single MDP and the variation across tasks can be described by just the single latent variable, it means that we can instead rely on uh, the number of samples that you see in aggregate over all of your tasks, um, which is a pretty significant improvement. And that's sort of denoted by this N5D here. So now we can move to the empirical results. So um, we've just modified some basic benchmarks that we typically use in reinforcement learning. So here we're just looking at DeepMind control. Um, and we, we're modifying just specific factors in each of these environments in order to create this, this uh, um, range of different dynamics across these tasks. So um, here we examine four environments, but only two of them have differences in dynamics that are visually observable. So those ones I have here. So on the top, we have half cheetah, where the length of the torso changes. And on the bottom, it's harder to see, but we have walker and the size of the left foot also changes. And so these are two examples of two things that change the dynamics. Um, we also change things like the friction coefficient and um, uh, for finger spin, I think, yeah, for finger spin, we change the friction coefficient that the, the component like spins at. And I think for walker run, we change the friction coefficient with the floor to also change the dynamics. Um, so here we're looking at evaluation performance on new unseen environments, on environments with different dynamics than what the agent saw at training time. Um, so we compare against other multitask methods like distral, grad norm, and PC grad. And the, the component that I really wanna highlight is the difference between our method hit BMDP and the sublation hit BMDP node by sim. So this in orange is really just um, the exact same thing as our method, but without the constraint in the task embedding space that, to incorporate this like smoothness with respect to the changes in dynamics. And so we can see that the difference in performance here is entirely just because of that, that, uh, that objective that we have in the task embedding space. We also have results for the meta reinforcement learning setting. So the main difference here is that instead of showing zero shot generalization, we're showing performance when the agent can update, um, uh, can update for a few cycles on the new unseen environment in the, in, at evaluation time. So here we can see that the differences in performance are much smaller because um, HIP, both HIP BMDP and Perl are able to update based on the new samples from the new evaluation time. Another thing that we can look at um, in the meta reinforcement learning setting is just model error. Um, and so again, we're just looking at our method compared to the ablation without that context, uh, without that, that task embedding objective. And we can see that our learned dynamics model can generalize much more quickly to the new environment compared to the version uh, without that objective. Um, Another thing we can look at is just relaxing the block MDP assumption. So I, I kind of glossed over this, but a key component of the block MDP assumption is that we're assuming we have the Markov property and the observation space. And so um, this is the only thing really that separates it from the PongDP setting. Um, this is a pretty stringent assumption to make in a lot of real world settings. And so what we did here is we wanted to see how gracefully does our method degrade compared to other baselines if we were to relax the Markov assumption. So in fingerspin, what we did is for some probability P, the agent's not gonna see the current observation, it's going to get dropped and it just gets a copy of the previous observation again. Um, I wanna highlight that uh, in this example, these the agent is not using history and so it's not using a 
it's it's not able to um, uh, it won't be able to achieve sort of the best performance it can because it's it is losing information. So we can see here on the right hand side that performance degrades as p gets larger, which is not a surprise. Um, but on the left hand side, I think this is interesting, which is that when we compare for a small p against the other baselines, um, it seems like our method is still able to perform better in this setting than the other baselines do. So to conclude from this work, uh, I, I think really the main contribution is that we highlight that we should be using different types of frameworks to address multitask reinforcement learning. Um, and, and really what we're exploiting here is just this latent structure in the dynamics. We show that you can provide error and value bounds for both uh, state space and rich observation space setting. Um, settings and, and show these improvements in sample complexity. And our code is also publicly available. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the limitations of this work. So um, here, the multitask setting, I uh, after working on this, I, I kind of decided I really didn't like it because um, we have we assume access to something that I think you can think of as like privileged information. The fact that each task is clearly delineated, we're given access to this environment ID. Um, I think a much more realistic and interesting setting is the continual learning setting, um, where, where things like dynamics and reward can possibly change slowly over time. Um, after working on this, after, after being really excited about this HIP MDP setting, I realized that we could have very easily handled different reward functions as well that could have been incorporated as part of a notion of distance between tasks. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to be able to handle more realistic settings and specifically I mean settings where more than one factor varies at a time and I think the interesting thing to look at there is if you can learn um, this task embedding space that decomposes nicely and can also generalize to new compositions um, of those factors. So in order to address some of these limitations, I think the contextual MDP framework is actually um, a little bit more universal and, and more useful than the hidden parameter MDP one. And so the contextual MDP setting, you can think of as there, you having all of these similar tasks that potentially even have different state spaces, different dynamics and different reward. Um, and they're described by this different context. And so now the question is, how do we leverage shared structure across these tasks? So we, I, I think it's useful to, to look at sort of like the formal definitions of these things. So the contextual MDP, um, we now have this C, this context space. Um, same, typically you assume that the, you have the same state and action space across these uh, different MDPs. Um, but here your reward and dynamics are now conditioned on C. So we're just gonna update this a little bit because I think this is still a little bit restrictive. So um, we're defining a block contextual MDP where the only difference is that we now assume your state space can change across different tasks. And this makes sense, right? Like um, in the real world, if your state space is the entire world, um, if, you, if your attention shifts to different tasks, then that's fine, your dynamics are different, but your state space has to be the same. But in actuality, what we do is, is we try to constrain the state space to only pay attention to what matters for a specific task, which means that your state space will change depending on what your task is because you want to attend to different things. So I think of this as sort of just like a continuation of that first paper on um, HIP BMDPs that kind of fixes a lot of the issues that I had raised at the end. Um, so now we're looking at the non-stationary setting. We care about continual learning. Um, and I think like the, the motivation for this work is also just looking at adaptive control. So I think adaptive control is really nice because the goal there is to just, inf you, you know what you don't know. Um, you, when we can call this known unknowns, um, where you know what the variable is that you're trying to infer. You just don't know what the value of that is in, in different states. Um, and I, we want to extend this idea to the setting where we have unknown unknowns. We don't know what we don't know, and we need to infer it to try and get good performance in these new unseen environments. Um, I want to define an additional thing that I, I think is really useful. So, so um, uh, 
one property that I think that we want to have in order to get good generalization is smoothness, is, is the Lipschitz property. So we can define a Lipschitz block contextual and DP as one in which your dynamics and your reward are Lipschitz with respect to this context. Um, this seems like a limitation, but I'm going to show how, because we are not given this context space, um, so I can, you can think of like, if you're given the context space, then you're, and you're just trying to infer what the context is for different environments, then that's the known unknown setting. If we're not given the context space and we have to construct it ourselves, we're in the unknown, un un unknown unknowns setting. Um, and so if we don't have the context space, then we can actually construct one that obeys this property, um, which is why I'm putting this here. Uh, so this is a more formal definition of the task metric that we'd kind of defined previously in the HIP BMDP setting. It just now also incorporates reward. So we can define a notion of distance between tasks that just depends on the difference in the reward and the difference in the dynamics between, uh, for those tasks. So I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, and if we learn a task embedding space that obeys this distance metric, this D task, then we have the property that the optimal universal value function conditioned on C is Lipschitz with respect to this task metric. And so this is a property that we want to have that we're, we're gonna try and construct like with our method. Uh, another assumption that we have to make for this setting is identifiability. So now, because we're in this non-stationary continual learning setting, it means like because we don't have, we're not, um, I mean, the, the main relaxation here, right, from the multitask setting is that we no longer assume access to a task ID. So if we don't have the task ID, it actually puts us in the partial observability setting. So what this assumption is saying is really that um, given a sufficient history or given some amount of history, we can, it is possible to infer what the context is. And so I think another way of thinking about this is that we're really just making an assumption that we're in a K order MDP as opposed to like a true POM DP where sort of like worst case is unboundedly bad. Um, another nice result that comes from um, um, older work uh, is just this generalization via Lipschitz continuity. So basically, if you have the, if your learning algorithm has the property of being Lipschitz, then um, even if you're collecting data in the reinforcement learning way, even, even if you don't have the IID assumption, um, we can bound sort of the, the, uh, generalization gap of this algorithm. Um, and so this is a result that we can actually apply to our setting. And so I, and, and uh, we can only apply this to our setting because we are trying to um, form a representation space that has the Lipschitz property. Uh, another type of generalization bound, which is now much more relevant for the reinforcement learning setting is, is just, uh, again, something that looks very similar to the kinds of bounds that we had in the HIP BMDP setting. Um, here, just focusing on uh, transfer across different contexts. And so this looks the same as before. It's just that we've now replaced theta with this context C and the C incorporates both differences in dynamics and reward. So this gives rise to our, our algorithm. And I think like, again, if you were following along with the HIP BMDP paper, this looks very similar. And the main difference is that instead of assuming access to task IDs, we are using the, the, the history uh, in, from our environment. Um, and so we're using the inter interaction history in place of the task ID to feed into our context encoder. We still have a very similar kind of context loss as we had in the HIP BMDP setting. Um, it just now uses the task metric, which depends on dynamics and reward. We still need those same components of training like a dynamics loss and reward loss so that we can compute what this task metric is. And then we can apply a soft vector critic on top. Um, and so we look at, we have different, we have experiments looking at two different uh, types of settings. So one is non-stationary dynamics. So this is the same set of environments that we had in the HIP BMDP setting. We now are comparing against um, other sort of uh, 
like other kind of system identification methods that also don't assume access to the task ID. Um, and we again perform the same ablation here where our method Zeus, um, we also have Zeus no context loss, so we don't have that context objective in our context embedding space that we're constructing. And so we can see that our method performs much better um, than any of these other baselines and this ablation in red. And this also, we don't have HIP BMDP in here because it, it's not really a fair comparison because HIP BMDP needs access to the task ID. Um, but these do get much better generalization performance than HIP BMDP as well. We can also now look at non stationary reward. Um, and so we look at two environments here. This cheetah run is different from the one on the previous slide. So this one, we just have uh, different target velocities. Um, and so here in, in both of these examples, uh, in, in all of these experiments here, what we're looking at in terms of validation is, is um, generalization to new unseen environments. So same baselines, same ablations, just now looking at non-stationary reward. Um, the other environment is just this Sawyer peg. Uh, and so it's just a Sawyer arm that has to insert uh, this key into, or this peg into, into um, into different holes. And so it, it's asked to, um, at training time, it is training to insert this peg into a different hole uh, at training time in a new unseen hole at test time. And so we can see again that Zeus is, performs much better than all of these other environments. And, you know, I think these are all like very standard type of like main result experiments, but um, I like this experiment a lot better. So we want to be able to interpret what kind of context embedding we've learned. Um, in these kinds of more toy environments, because we know, uh, because we've designed the environments, we, we do actually know what is the true latent variable? What is the thing that we're varying across these different tasks? Um, so this is looking at that, that uh, half cheetah where the torso length changes. And these indices just represent um, the order of the torso length. So these task IDs really do have some structure in it in that um, task IDs that are closer together represent tasks that are also closer together in terms of dynamics. So we see, um, so here we're just plotting uh, cosine similarity in terms of the context embedding that we're learning. And so we can see this, this really nice, uh, this is normalized, which is why it looks so nice between like zero and one. Um, but we can see that the, the context space that we've learned perfectly captures the true ordering of tasks, the true, the sort of like true ordering of, of the actual latent variable, which is the cheetah torso length. Um, and we see that if we don't have that context loss, so this corresponds to that Zeus no context loss ablation, um, there's some structure there, but it, it like the ordering is not preserved. And so uh, I really like this because it shows that we are able to, in an unsupervised way, capture sort of meaningful information about the true context. So I, I think the takeaways from this paper are that um, we're now tackling the non-stationary setting, the continual learning setting with this block contextual MDP framework. And so this framework allows us to take um, RL algorithms that do, uh, that rely on this stationarity assumption, which I think of as like a very limiting one um, and apply them to this new setting. We've proposed a method that can adapt to new unseen environments with zero shot uh, generalization. And a nice thing about this method is that it doesn't require learning updates. We're in effect just learning like an inference module that learns to detect what, how things have changed uh, um, in comparison to environments that it has seen before. And the, it makes this method very amenable to safety critical um, settings where you can train a model, you can verify it, and then you can deploy it on new unseen environments and trust that it'll adapt um, in, an, in expected ways. Um, and so I, I think that that's sort of a crucial difference between this method and meta learning methods that do rely um, that do rely on having access to optimization updates at test time.
So one major, I think, uh, not surprising limitation is that we do still see that generalization degrades as we move further away from the training distribution. Uh, and so in this plot, we're just seeing that uh, this is now on the, the half cheetah task where the reward is changing, so different target velocities. So we can see that as the target velocity gets higher or moves further away from what it saw at training time, um, the performance of all methods, all these methods do degrade, um, but we're still able to obtain better performance than we did at baselines. But obviously, ideally, we want this to be flat, like we really want to have a method that truly can generalize um, because we know that it should be capable of it. Okay, so final piece of work that I wanted to talk about was um, still looking at this multitask setting and still looking at context, but um, now looking at a different type of context. Like what if you have useful side information? Um, examples of this are are like what if you have access to instructions right like you you could have a command that's that's you know like go pour me coffee but you can have um, a more informative version of that which is like you know you need to put the coffee pot in the coffee maker you know put in water put in coffee grounds etc um so and and i think this is well yeah i i have a slide later that talks about a little bit about nethack but i know that you guys are all very familiar with that setting so i think nethack is also sort of like a um a very intuitive example of of context aside information right like the wiki is not needed in order to um for the agent to explore the environment and and to get reward but it's it's very useful and, and i i think actually necessary so the problem setting that we're focusing on in this paper is meta world. And I, and I think it's useful to show this because it'll give some intuition for the method. So meta world is a multitask uh, benchmark and it has MT10 with just these 10 environments uh, and MT50 with 50 environments. Um, so it's a multitask setting. So they assume that you have access to a task ID um, what they also give you are these short sentence descriptions of the tasks. These sentences were not meant to be part of the MDP, so it's never it's not supposed to be something that was given to the agent. The sentences were just provided for human consumption so that we could read these sentences and, and then exactly understand like what this task is without having to play around with the environment. And so if this if these short sentences can be useful for us, then it makes sense that they can also be useful for the agent. And so um, our method, contextual attention-based representation learning care, um, we just, this is just a way for us to incorporate the information in those sentences in a multitask pipeline. And the way we do that is um, we are training a mixture of K encoders. And I think like a, a, a way to interpret what this is doing is that we want each of these K encoders to correspond to something interpretable that's shared across tasks. So um, in this meta world setting, you know, we can see that there are objects and skills that are shared across these tasks. Um, there are multiple tasks with a puck that you're trying to push around to a goal, um, multiple tasks with uh, a drawer, multiple tasks with a window. Um, and there are also skills across these that are the same, like open versus close versus push. And so I, I think like we can think of this mixture of K encoders where each encoder corresponds to one of those objects or skills. Um, so we have this mixture of representations and we want to now learn a universal representation that's useful across all of our tasks. But the way that we combine these representations into this universal one will depend on the context. So we take our metadata here, which is just this, those natural language sentences. We use Roberta as a pre-trained language model to, to turn those into an embedding. Um, and we train a context encoding from that embedding. And we uh, use that context encoding. Um, that context encoding is used as input into an attention mechanism that dictates how these different representations are combined together. And so now we have a universal representation for which we can use a universal pol policy algorithm in this multitask setting. And we basically find that we get state of the art results on meta world. We get better performance than any existing method on this benchmark just from incorporating this metadata 
Um, so we have the baseline um, uh, uh, comparisons with multitask uh, SAC, multitask SAC with the task encoder, multi-head SAC, um, also other multitask methods, again, PC grad, soft modularization, which takes the same policy network and does uh, different routing depending on the task to create like different policies. Um, and we also incorporated film. So film is like a general conditioning method for um, natural language. Um, and it's not was not meant for the reinforcement learning setting, but we thought of this as sort of like a, a, a useful baseline. And so we just incorporated film with soft actor credit to see how well it performs in the reinforcement learning setting. Um, and then we also have an upper bound. So if we just train a single SAC agent per task, this is its performance. And so we can see that there's still a small gap. So there's still room for improvement, but this could also have to do with um, um, parameterization, right? The fact that this, given that we're training one SAC agent per task, this will have a lot more parameters than any of these other methods. And so we have results for MT10 and MT50, um, and we can see that we get better performance than all of these other baselines. So, a, an important question to ask here is because we have all of these like new components um, is, you know, what is actually contributing to this better performance? So we just look at these ablations on, on both settings. Um, we have soft actor, credit, soft actor critic with just the mixture of encoders. So no metadata. So it just gets passed in like a task ID instead. We have soft actor critic with metadata, but without the mixture of encoders and then the whole combination, which is our method. And so we can see that um, the metadata is definitely more important than the mixture of encoders, but both things together is still better than everything else. And, and I, you know, it's the same kind of visualization as the last paper, but I, I really like this. Um, so here again, we're looking at cosine similarity across like all of the tasks, um, the task embeddings. Um, what we are showing here, so in this first image, we just have the pre-trained task embeddings, or actually really what, sorry, I shouldn't have written task embeddings, this is confusing. This is just the embeddings out of Roberta. So this is just out of the um, language model. And so we can see, you don't even need to use Roberta. I think if you just treated the words as tokens, you would see this same kind of similarity. It's just that how many words in common do these different sentences have? This corresponds to the cosine some of the like uh, these tasks having more similarity. But we see that when we use these language embed these um, this language embedding as input into our method, um, and now we can look at our context embeddings at the end of training. We can see that that structure persists, and actually. Um, for some of these tasks, it actually gets even stronger. So these areas in yellow that differ between these two are between 9, 10, and 4, 5, 6. So we can see that the things that these have in common are opening and closing um, doors and drawers and windows. And so I think the really nice thing here is that um, our agent has discovered that opening and closing a door versus a drawer versus a window is very similar and even more similar than the sentences would have, you could tell from the sentences. Uh, and so we can see that this, this similarity is leveraged. Um, in comparison, if we just train care, but without using the metadata as those embeddings, we no similarity is found. And so it means that having access to that metadata is really important for finding this similar structure across tasks. Um, another experiment that we wanted to try was to see if we can get zero shot generalization to new unseen environments. There's some hope that we can do this because of the compositional aspect um, of, of this environment. You know, the fact that like different objects and different skills, like if you've learned these things separately, maybe we can combine them together. Um, so we only try this with MT10. We were very careful about picking like which in, which of the environments we train on and which are the two environments we test on. So we're evaluating on drawer open and window open with the idea that it has learned um, how to open thing other things in the training tasks and it understands the dynamics of drawers and windows also from the training tasks. 
Um, performance is pretty abysmal. Uh, it's better than the other methods, but uh, obviously there's still a lot of room for improvement. So I'm really excited about sort of trying to improve uh, performance in, in this aspect in terms of this kind of compositional generalization, but um, not sure yet how to do this. So uh, to conclude from this paper, uh, which is getting presented at ICML this year, I, uh, I think the main takeaways are site information is important. Uh, if we can incorporate it in the right way, we can dramatically improve performance. We show that one way of doing this is through using this mixture of encoders that allows for positive transfer. And I think a key question to ask now is like, how can we scale this up? And so this is where NetHack comes in. Um, you know, NetHack has this wiki that, that uh, uh, I think the thing that Tim likes to say, right, is that no human has been able to solve NetHack without reading the wiki, uh, without using the wiki. Um, and so I, I think there's huge problems, um, open problems here of how we can take something like care, um, which we show works in this very toy setting with just these very simple sentences, how we can apply something like that to NetHack. Um, and, and for me, I guess like the things that I'm excited about, again, sort of tying these things back into applications um, personalizing healthcare, treating each patient, you can treat each patient and patient information as context. And so through this, we can get, we can expect generalization to new patients, maybe who have, who have, um, who have different metadata, who have different information about their lives and their health. Um, but we should be able to get compositional generalization to these patients. Same thing with household robots. We should be able to generalize to new environments and layouts. We should be able to generalize to new tasks just through like simple language instruction. Um, and uh, yeah, so in, in conclusion, I think sort of like the, the takeaways from this talk from, from these three papers is that I think leveraging structure will improve generalization, context, is a way to convey the structure that exists in the environment, both um, either as metadata or learned um, from just like the dynamics. And context comes in different forms. Um, it can be just like the history and the environment. It can be natural language. It can be um, video, video demonstrations. Um, and yeah, so I, I think this is something that would be really interesting to sort of to discuss and, and learn also from the things that you guys are working on, sort of like what are other forms of context, what are interesting applications of these kinds of works. Um, and then obviously I none of this work would be possible without my collaborators. So these are just the people that I worked with on these three papers. Um, and yeah, so now I'm, I'm really happy to take any questions or uh, comments from people.